Hello everyone, I'm Betsy Kinsey and today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Mark Tatel. Dr. Mark Tatel earned his bachelor's in biological sciences from Northwestern University and his PhD in neuroscience and behavior at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. In between his time in Chicago and Amherst, he was able to spend time traveling abroad. He conducted his postdoctoral research on steroid receptor action in breast cancer at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. Now, Dr. Tatel teaches neuroscience and biology at Wellesley. His lab investigates how ovarian hormones affect rodent brains and behavior. His lab collaborates with other colleagues at Wellesley, elsewhere in the US and abroad. And of course, at the Albright Institute, we love to see this collaboration. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Tatel. So thank you very much, Betsy. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to meeting with all of you. Some of you look familiar from, uh, I think, this past fall during the interviews or last spring. I don't remember when, but they were fun. I, I enjoyed them. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, from decision making to deal making, um, how hormones influence our brains and behavior. So we're going to be talking about certain instances and situations that might not really relate to what you guys are interested in, but I think the challenge will be for you guys to expand it and apply it to the projects that you're working on. We'll talk about that more at the end. Okay? The other thing is I really want this to be in as, in as interactive as possible, so if you have any questions at any time, raise your hand. Um, if I don't see you, then blurt something out. And if that doesn't work, talk to us. I'm going to ask you to blurt out if you see a hand go up and I just go right past it, okay? So we'll get questions. So we'll start off with this. What is this? Sign of for what? For females. And does anyone know what it is, though, what it's symbolic of or what it symbolizes? It's, it's the mirror of um, uh, Venus. Venus's mirror, right? And this? Male. Anyone know what that, that symbolizes? <laughs> Sword and shield of Mars. Okay, so why did I put these up there? Not just to throw that trivia at you. Um, so let's talk about what are differences between men and women or males and females? So not just humans, but animals as well, right? What are differences? This is the interactive part. Oh, you have to use a microphone. Oh. That's going to take a while. Um, a certain set of genital organs or biological organs. Okay. So genitalia are different, right? Males and females have gen different genitalia. What else? Yeah? Um, they're often like secondary sexual characteristics. Like the males of a species will often be more vibrantly colored or have bigger whatever. Okay, so the male peacock, right? Yeah. More plumage. Um, and also, uh, males are often larger, and in our species that's the case. Men are larger than women for the most part. What else? That's a good one. Yeah. Um, different hormonal okay. fluctuations and balances. Okay, so different hormones. Mm -hmm. Men have more, what? Testosterone. Testosterone, and women have more estrogens yeah, and progestins. But what's important, and I'll probably say it again, it's important to realize that women have testosterone and men have estrogens and progestins. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, any, anything else? So we've talked a lot about the physiology, which is great. You guys have talked about the physiology. Body shape, um, hormones, we could talk about genetics, right? XX, XY. What about some other things? What else is different between males and females? Not having to do with physiology. Okay, so society... Um, treats men and women differently, girls and boys differently, and that also exists in the animal world too, right? Males are treated differently than females. That's right. What else? Um, I'm just I think um, male and female think differently and consider okay. different side of one, let's say one event, they will okay. see different. Okay, so that can get a little sticky, a little controversial, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll go with that. Let's, let's incorporate the word behavior, all right? Because that's going to fall into behavior. So behavior is different, right? So what are some behaviors that are different between either men and women or males and females? Yeah.
we can just leave it on the whole time. <laughs> So males are seen as more uh, aggressive and like females are seen as more passive. Like in the animal world, like the males will cart the females and like things like that also happens in the human world. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so in the animal world, males are more aggressive, right? Although that's, there is a type of aggression that females have, maternal aggression. That is a whole different kind of aggression that we're not going to get into, but it's actually very, it's fascinating. It's very different than what we usually conceive of as aggression, but that's right. Aggressive, aggression behavior, aggressive behavior is different. What else? Anything else can you guys think of? Yep. Uh, females are generally considered more nurturing because okay, they have so that maternal instinct. We're going to say that parental behavior, yeah. right? Now, I'm going to be defensive here. I have kids. There's maternal behavior and there's also paternal behavior, right? So it's not that men or males don't show the behavior, but that it's different, right? But in some species, there isn't much paternal behavior. But in humans, I like to think there is. <laughs> but right, so parental behavior, aggressive behavior, sexual behavior, right? All these things are different in males and females. So all these differences that we've talked about, body shape, behavior, cognition, um, I forgot, oh, genitalia, all these things are influenced by hormones. All of those things are influenced by hormones throughout the life of the animal. And we're not going to talk about it in too much depth. We're going to talk about one circumstance later. But I just want you guys to understand how powerful hormones are and what they do. They do lots of different things. Okay, so what is a hormone? So a hormone is a chemical messenger that's released from an endocrine gland and it travels in the bloodstream and acts, can act throughout the body. So it travels throughout the body. Right? And here are some examples of some of the endocrine glands that we'll be talking about today. Okay, so here's the brain and the brain right below it has the pituitary gland and that releases hormones. Uh, there's also the ovaries or the testes. Together, those are called the gonadal, um, the gonads. So we'll talk about the gonadal hormones. And then we'll also be talking about the adrenal glands right here on top of your kidneys, right? You have two of them. And those uh, control the stress hormones. So we'll be focusing today on the gonadal steroid hormones. Estrogens are a class of hormones. Estradiol is an example of an estrogen. Progestins, progesterone is an example of a progestin, and testosterone is an example of an androgen, right? And as we've already said, and you guys already pointed this out, um, these are more predominant in females, and these are more predominant in males, but it's important to understand that females and women have androgens, and men have estrogens and progestins, right? Just not as at a, as a high levels. Okay, so these hormones act throughout the body to do lots of different things. So androgens act to increase muscle mass. Um, estrogens and progestins act in the development and differentiation of breast tissue and in the maintenance of breast tissue. Um, bone estrogens also act at bone. So if you guys, maybe your grandmother might be going through menopause, so her ovaries are shutting down. Her estrogen levels are declining, going way down. And that's why she's losing bone mass. And that's why older women often break their hip because they've lost estrogens that maintain bone mass. Um, we also know that these hormones act at reproductive organs. They're also really involved in energy homeostasis. So estrogens um, do a lot to maintain feeding and body weight. So again, if you talk to your grandmother who's gone through menopause, she'll probably tell you that it's harder to keep weight off, right? That she gains weight after menopause. And much of that is due to the fact that she's lost estrogens. Because estrogens actually decrease feeding, increase activity, and decrease weight gain. And that's one of the things we're studying in my lab, is how estrogens do that. So we do two things in my lab. We look at the role of estrogens in energy homeostasis or weight gain. We also look at the role that hormones play in the brain to regulate behavior. So these different tissues, right, muscle, breast, bone, brain, they all have receptors for these hormones. That's how they respond to the hormones. So estrogens bind to estrogen receptors, and androgens bind to androgen receptors. And we're just going to briefly go over how hormones work, because this is what I get really excited about, but I understand that probably not all of you are that excited about this. This is a cell, right? So it's going back to your high school biology, or maybe 110 if you took it here. And inside the cell, you have an estrogen receptor. And when estradiol binds to its receptor, it'll cause two of these receptors to bind together. And then these receptors will bind to DNA, or genes, in the cell, and turn genes on, right? So this is how these hormones work in the body, how they have their effects all over the body. Yeah? Um, so the estrogen receptor is not bound to the membrane? I'm a biochemist. 
Okay. So yeah, now we've got a biochemistry question. So that's right. Usually you hear about receptors that are on the outsides of cells. These hormones have receptors that are inside the cells that directly interact with DNA. Having said that, in the last 10 years, now maybe more, 15, 20 years, we found out that these, there are estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors on the outsides of cells. But it was very heretical at the time, and people thought everyone was crazy, the people that were saying that. But now we accept that they're both on the outside and the inside of cells. Sorry, is the reason that they bind directly to DNA because are they small lipid molecules that can move through the okay. membrane? <laughs> exactly. So um, the receptors are inside the cell, but the hormones are lipid-based. So they can easily slip through that phospholipid bi bilipid membrane, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, great questions. Okay, so what we study in my lab is how this process works, how this process works in brain to regulate gene expression in brain and the regulation of both um, reproductive behavior and feeding and energy homeostasis. But I'm actually not going to talk about that today. Okay? I'm not going to talk really about the research that we do. Um, one, and another reason we like to study uh, this is not just to figure out how these hormones work in rats and mice, but the same hormones that rats and mice have are the same hormones that we have and, this, and the same with the receptors. So the hormones and the receptors are very similar between mice and humans. So mice and rats make a great model to study how these hormones work. And the better we understand how these hormones work in animals, the better we can understand how they work in our bodies. And one thing that these hormones are related to are, is health and diseases like cancer. So in cancer, I'm going to use breast cancer as an example where about one in eight women will contract breast cancer at some point in her life. Doesn't mean that one in eight women will die from breast cancer, but one in eight women will be diagnosed from, with breast cancer in the U.S. Um, one thing we know is that in terms, in, in, uh, in regard to estrogens, estrogens can sometimes inappropriately activate this pathway that I showed you, and that can lead to the, the growth of tumors, of estrogen-dependent tumors like breast cancer. So one thing we do in our lab is we study drugs that actually block these receptors and don't allow this process to happen. Tamoxifen is one of those drugs, if you've heard about it, one of the most widely prescribed drugs for breast cancer. So we're looking at ways that tamoxifen works both in the body and the brain to try and figure out how it, how it functions. But again, I'm not going to talk about that. So there are two main effects of gonadal hormones. One are organizing effects. So these are things that occur early in life and are permanent and irreversible. So I've given a couple examples of this, development of sex organs. So we talked about male and female genitalia being different. And we're going to talk briefly about the role of hormones in brain development. And then there are activating effects. These are things that occur well after birth, usually around puberty or after puberty. They're said to be transient, so they can come and go, right? They can be turned on and off. And examples of this are ovulation in women, spermatogenesis in man, and then also behavior, right? So this idea that hormones can influence behavior, they can do it in this transient way. And these are said to have activating effects. So what we're first going to do is we're going to, I'm going to give you a brief example of organizing effects of hormones on brain development. And then much of what we'll be talking about are the activating effects of hormones, these effects that occur in adulthood and sort of come and go, on and off. Okay, so I want to give you an example of the role of hormones in brain development. And we're going to talk about sexual differentiation of the brain. So when the fetus is developing, it has one brain, right? And that brain usually becomes either male-like or female-like, and that's the process of sexual differentiation. So we're going to look at an example from a rat brain. We're going to look at this nucleus, which was one of the first sexually dimorphic nucleus, nuclei to be discovered, which is how it got its name. And we're going to look at a rat brain, we're going to look at a section of a rat brain, so this is the front of the brain and the back of the brain. We're going to look at one slice, we're going to lay it flat, and that's shown here. So we're looking at one little section of this brain, and we're just going to look at this cluster of cells here. All these dark spots are brain cells, and you see that nice big dark cluster right around here, right? And this is a female, a female rat. And you notice that that cluster is much smaller. This is about three to five times larger than the female. Right? And these rats were, um, their brains were taken out in the first week of life. I'm sorry, in the, in about, after about second week of life. Now if you take a female and on the day she's born, inject her with testosterone, 
and then wait that two weeks, this is what you get. You get a male-like brain, right? So it's the presence of testosterone that's driving the brain to differentiate into a male-like brain. And conversely, it's the absence of testosterone that allows the female-like brain to develop. Now, this was work that was done a long time ago by Roger Gorsky, um, and the field has really um, you know, exploded since then. There's lots of research that's been done on that. We know a lot about the molecular mechanisms that are occurring and how this, how this happens, and other brain regions have been found. But I just want to give you this one classic example and how hormones really profoundly can affect brain development. So just to review, you have an undifferentiated brain, and in an XY individual, it can become a male-like brain, and that's due to this testosterone, actually, that's a, that it's exposed to in uterus and then right after birth. And then in an XX individual, you get a female-like brain. Now, I've taken the liberty of showing you pictures of my kids <laughs> because um, uh, I wanted to, but, but also... <laughs> um, uh, I'm suggesting that this is what happens in humans. We don't know for sure, right? Because I don't think many people would want to sacri would want to have their kids be experimented on. But we do know that this happens in, in lots of animals, and we think that this same process or a similar process is occurring in, in humans. Um, so that's the first point I want to make. Second point I want to make is it's the presence of testosterone that's driving the development of this male-like behavior, absence of testosterone that's, developing, that's driving this development of female-like uh, brain, sorry. And then I also need to point out that my daughter here, she's about 12 now, so she'd be pretty embarrassed if I told you this, but she was a fairy princess. She wasn't a fairy in this picture. She wasn't a princess, but a fairy princess, and she was very emphatic about that at that time. So I feel the need to still emphasize that. Okay, so hormones have a profound effect on sexual differentiation of the brain, right? This is an organizing effect, something that occurs early in life and is irreversible. So now let's say, are there sex differences in the human brain. And why is this important? So I think this is important for a few reasons. First of all, I think intellectually it's a fascinating question, right? Are male brains human, are men's brains different than women's brains? I think it gets at who we are, and it has clinical relevance, right? Because there are sex differences in brain disorders. So if we look at these sex differences in brain disorders, maybe we can get a better handle on them if we can understand why there are sex differences in the brain itself, right? So I just want to show you some of these. Um, this is, these are diseases that are more prevalent in women than men, Alzheimer's disease, and this is after, um, after there's been uh, accounting for the fact that women live longer. Um, depression, anxiety disorders, and eating disorders. And just so uh, Takas and Joe and I don't feel left out, um, there are also uh, diseases that are more prevalent in men than women. Parkinson's disease, ADHD, autism. Schizophrenia isn't more prevalent in men, but it has an earlier onset, earlier diagnosis, and a much poorer prognosis than in women. Yes? Um, so, to what extent can you control for different, like, societal differences? For example, a lot of young boys are diagnosed with ADHD in schools because they're, they're not very good at sitting, and women tend to have more eating disorders, or at least get more attention for eating disorders because we have a lot of you know, media bias about like women's bodies and that sort of that's thing. That's right, that's right. So, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting that there are no societal impacts on these differences. Um, diagnosis is one issue and I think those, whenever something, whenever there's a difference, people look at it closely and see if there's a difference in diagnosis. Are boys more readily um, diagnosed with ADHD than, than girls? And they're, they're, I'm sure they're, it's been shown that there is that effect. But people have done studies to show that even after that, they still think that it's more prevalent in boys than girls. That, that's what these disorders show. I'm also not suggesting that there aren't societal impacts on these diseases, like eating disorders, right? But all I, what I am suggesting is that we know there are these sex differences in the way these diseases are expressed. And as scientists, we want to look at, well, what are the bio does biology contribute to that, right? And so we think that sex differences in the brain may contribute. We think that differences in hormones might contribute to some of these, right? So we want to look at all the different factors. But yeah, you're bringing up a great point, that there are differences in diagnoses, and physicians and scientists are always trying to deal with that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering also, oh, just maybe for the sake of simplicity, but is, would you say that there's a gradient as well in terms of the levels of 
these hormones that may make it a little bit more leveled out rather than binary in terms of behavior and... Um, oh, sure. Um, if I understand your question correctly, I mean, uh, using testosterone as an example, men have more testosterone than women, but that's not to say that women don't have any testosterone. And there's a gradient within women where women have low levels of testosterone or higher levels. Is that what you mean? Yeah, precisely. And that's a great point that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Hormones are fluctuating and changing across an individual's life, but they're also different among groups. You can find men with lower testosterone levels than other men, and the same with women. And it's true of all these hormones. Yeah. yeah great point, which feeds in well with what we're talk with what we're going to be talking about. Here's one sex difference, one of the earliest sex differences that was found in human brains. This is the corpus callosum here, this white band of fibers that connects your left side of your brain with your right side of your brain. So that way my left hand knows what my right hand is doing and they don't get in each other's way or fight with each other and lots of other things. And what was found is that um, the splenium, right? So this little ball in the corpus callosum is larger in females than it is in males. Right? So there's one sex difference, one of the earlier sex differences that was what was found by Laura Allen back in the early 90s. Now we know there are lots of other sex differences in humans that have been found. Some things larger in men, some things larger in women, um, and people really don't know what the, uh, what the implications of this are, right? Because we still don't have a great handle on what all these brain regions do in humans. We just know that there are differences. And now people are doing functional studies trying to get at what these differences are and what they might be doing, but those are hard things to answer. But it is important to know that there are differences in these brain regions. And just because a brain region is bigger doesn't necessarily mean it's better, right? Doesn't mean that it does anything better than any, any other brain region. I'll ask you a question. Who do you think has bigger brains, men or women? After accounting for, for body size, who thinks it's men? Who thinks it's women? Who thinks they're the same? Okay, this hurts, men. So men have larger brains. Actually, I think I say it right here. I meant to ask this before we got to this, right? I meant to ask it before we got here. So I've been at Wellesley, I think, for almost 10 years now, and one thing I've learned is women are smarter than men. So I think that shows that size really doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Especially when it comes to the brain, right? Just because the region's bigger doesn't mean it does something any better. But it is interesting to know that there are differences. So now let's talk about what we came to talk about, and that's neuroeconomics, right? So neuroeconomics, which can be defined as the attempt to understand the neurobiological mechanisms by which decisions are made. I like to just put it more simply, the neuroscience of decision making. So we'll talk about neuroeconomics now for the rest of the time, and I hope I encourage you guys to ask questions as you have been. I need to put in a disclaimer. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert on neuroeconomics. I don't even do research in neuroeconomics. I just find it fascinating. <laughs> I hit something, there we go. Um, I just find it fascinating. And what we're gonna talk about is the role of hormones in, in decision making. So do hormones influence decision making? So we're gonna look at this study that was done on stock traders and looking at their profits and loss. Maybe some of you are aware of this study. Um, what they did was they looked at males between the ages of, I think, 18 and 35 in London. And what they found was when they divided them up into those men that had low testosterone that particular day compared to what they usually have, or if their levels were higher compared to what they usually have, what they, usually have they found that men who had high testosterone levels performed better, right? So they had higher profits on those days than men who had low testosterone. And then this effect was even greater when they only took people who had been working two years or more, right? So there are lots of different ways to interpret this, right? One way the authors like to interpret is that, well, it might mean that testosterone has a role in attention. So maybe when these people's testosterone levels were higher, they were able to focus more. They were able to pay more attention to what they were doing. Maybe their visual motor tasks, their visual motor skills were more efficient, faster on that day, which has a lot to do with stock trading. Yeah? Um, were the losses also increased? Like 
So this is, so this is, um, I think it's, it's profits, higher profits on those days. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to look at another study that looks at what you're talking about with, with more volatility. I know. I think they, I think they mean, though, the profits, okay. that profits were larger than losses on those days. Yeah. And this, is So we'll talk about that, too. Great question. be attributed to um, like men of higher testosterone levels because they know they've made high profits this day so their testosterone levels rose? Yeah, so that's a great question. So if you take people who are engaged in sports and you look at testosterone levels in the winning team and the losing team, you'll find higher testosterone levels in the team that wins. But that's also easy to say, well, you know, maybe their testosterone levels are higher to begin with or whatever, right? So let's break it down even more. If you take chess matches, and right after the chess match, you take testosterone levels from the winner and the loser, the winner will have higher testosterone levels. So let's break it down even more. They did a study after the 2008 election, and they looked at those people who supported Obama compared to those people who supported McCain. And after that election, right after that election, like within 20 or 30 minutes of when polls closed and winners were announced, and the winner was announced, those people who supported Obama had higher testosterone levels than those people who supported McCain. So that suggests that there is this effect of winning, I think is what you're sort of getting at, that these people are engaged in this process and maybe they're doing well and their testosterone levels go up. These were taken um, late in the morning, I think at 11 a.m., which I assume occurs after at least half of the day is gone for these guys. So they might already be on this roll and there might be an effect of that. I don't know why they didn't do it earlier. Yeah. Um, just a clarifying question. When you say people had higher testosterone levels, are you talking only about males? Men, yeah, sorry. This whole study was done with men between the ages of 18 and 35. Okay, and that's the same with the polling results and with the sports uh, yes, teams as yeah, well? Yeah, I'm sorry. With all those, those were done in men. I, I don't know if... The, the, the polling was done in men. Actually, there was no difference in women in the, okay. in the, in the election experiment. It was only done in men. Okay. Um, and I think, though, they found the same thing with women athletes, the, vic the ones who are victorious versus the ones who are losers, winners versus losers. I think women have more testosterone. Yeah, pretty sure. Okay. So testosterone levels of male traders correlates positively with profits and losses, or really profits in this case. Okay, now let's look at the Iowa gambling task. The <laughs> Iowa gambling task. So this is um, sort of this weird task where you get a card, and in one pile, the initial cards have very uh, high reward, and then they go to higher punishment, right? You have two decks. So if you have a disadvantageous deck, Initially, in this deck, you have high reward in monetary units. And then as you go through the deck, you get increasing losses or increasing punishment, meaning more money is taken away. And at the end, you get to keep whatever money you have. In the advantageous deck, the initial reward is modest, but then the punishment or the loss of that reward, or loss of those monies is more modest. Right? So this really um, exemplifies more risk-taking, and this is the safer bet, right? So they did this study at uh, the University of Michigan with 20-year-olds, and they looked at both men and women. And they divided people up into high testosterone versus low testosterone in both, in both men and women, which gets at one of the last questions. Okay, so now they're going to look at who does more risk-taking? So I want everyone to get their prediction in their mind of what's, what's going to happen. So when they looked at men comparing low testosterone to high testosterone, there was no difference. So what they're doing here is this is a percentage of times they take the advantageous or the safe bet. So the lower the line is, the more risk-taking they're doing, right? But in women, there was a difference. 
those women with higher testosterone levels took more risk. Right? So testosterone had an effect in women, but not in men. In this task. And then this was actually supported, oh, so, sorry. So testosterone is positively correlated with risk-taking in women, but not men in this Iowa gambling task. Right. So they also, to sort of support this, another study that was done, um, was done with MBA students at, at the University of Chicago School of Business. And what they found in doing um, a lot of analysis, they found that women with high testosterone did more risk-taking and sought out higher-risk careers, such as careers in finance. So these are women overall who have higher testosterone levels compared with women who have lower testosterone levels, take more risk, and end up pursuing careers that have more risk. So again, arguing for a role of testosterone in risk-taking in women. So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about stress. So we've talked about the role of androgens, or I guess the influence that androgens might have in this financial risk preferences. But now let's look at stress and decision making and see if stress influences the way people um, behave in these kinds of situations. So first, what is stress? This is that interactive part again. <laughs> sure, she has the part. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it's chemicals in your brain, right? Okay, so, so that's going to mediate <coughs> this. <coughs> excuse me, that's good. That's going to mediate the stress response, right? But well, I guess what we're trying to get is what is stress? We all talk about it, right? But what is it? Okay. You, right here in the front row. <laughs> Not um, is it when like your body is out of equilibrium or homeostasis? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, so that's a, that's a great answer. So when your body is out of homeostatic balance, right? So your body has a set point that it wants to maintain and stress is what happens when it gets away from that set point, right? So that's sort of a real biological definition of stress. So a good example is when I walked over here from the Science Center, right, it was cold. And even though I had my big winter jacket on, my body had to do certain things to try and maintain my body temperature at its set point, right? So that's, temperature is a stressor, right? Something that can create stress. So what are some other stressors in life? Worries in okay. general can be, oh, you know, you worry about your livelihood in a sense, and so you're worried your body is, or your, your brain is worried about a threat to your livelihood. That's right. So, so resources, right? Money being one of them. What are other resources that we stress out about? Well, I was going to say love and relationships. Okay. okay. <laughs> but uh, that is yeah, that's a, a great resource. One. That's a great a one. So, relationships. Yeah. Okay. So, what kinds of relationships? We'll come back to resources then. Like literally any relationship <laughs> right. with your parents. Okay, with, so relationships with parents. Yeah, um, your significant other. Right, so your, your friends, partner. Yeah. Right, friends. Siblings. Family. Right? Teachers. Right. <laughs> Landlords. Uh, not a Wells one. <laughs> okay, so um, friends, family, uh, partners, significant others. Um, and then we'll put it in sort of uh, working relationships, right, or subordinate, um, dominant relationships, right, within the workplace, right? Those are stressful. Okay, any other? So now coming back to resources, money is one thing that we stress about. What else? Time. Time, okay. Yeah, time is a good <laughs> yeah, okay. okay, so food. Food is a, is a resource that we stress out about. What else? Yeah? 
Okay, so, so healthcare, right? So our, our health in general, but then also dealing with our health, getting healthcare. Anything else? Yeah. Expectations and responsibilities. Okay, okay, so expectations and that's, that's good. Okay, great. So we compete for lots of these things, right? We compete for lots of these resources. We compete for money, for food. What else do we compete for? Jobs, housing, right? Dorm rooms, right? We have a lottery every year, <laughs> right? And you have competition within your dorm room, probably if you have a roommate for resources and space. So is, uh, let's now think, we've been talking about humans, let's now talk about animals. So what are things that animals compete for? Well, they compete for mates, right? They compete for food, territory, right? Housing. Right? They have, a different, they have a different lottery system. Right? <laughs> but a lot of the same things that animals compete for, we compete for as well. Right? And so stress has a profound effect on our bodies. Right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the stress response. So the stress response is mediated by the stress axis, or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So this is where the hormones come into play that we were talking about earlier. So we have a stressor, here they listed as psychological or physical, so physical I guess could be temperature, psychological could be um, relationships, right? That gets um, perceived by the brain, right? Uh, the hypothalamus is a specific area in the brain, it releases a hormone to the pituitary, we were talking about the pituitary earlier, and the pituitary releases a hormone that stimulates the adrenal gland to release cortisol. Right? Cortisol is a stress hormone. It circulates through the whole body and has lots of different effects. One thing it does is it increases heart rate and it burns up carbohydrates. So why would that be? Why would we want that? Yeah. You think of the stress response as being related to like the fight or flight response? Right. So you need energy to fight off a predator That's or right. run away? Or so when you see that lion, Right? You want to be able to engage the stress response so you can have extra energy to get away from that lion. So the stress response is a good thing. Right? The only problem is, is that, well, one of the problems can occur. Cortisol then has negative feedback, right? meaning that as your body produces more cortisol, it's telling different parts of this axis, okay, we've got enough cortisol, you can, you can stop now. So that when you run away from that lion, once you get away from the lion, you can then decrease that stress response because you don't need it, right? The problem is, is when that mechanism gets messed up. The negative feedback gets messed up, and you're, if someone's exposed or an animal's exposed to stress over a long period of time, then they don't ever sort of ramp it down. And so I'm not going to talk about it now, although I'd love to, but um, when this axis gets messed up, it can lead to things like depression and anxiety disorders. Right, so there's a huge area of research now looking at the role of the HPA axis in, in anxiety disorders and depression and PTSD and all those things. Yeah? Is there a certain level to which the stress has to attain for that? Like, is perpetually having these terms? <laughs> so so that's, an, that's a good example. So let's get back to the being chased by the lion. That's a good thing, right? You want your stress response then, right? So some people get stressed out during finals. And in some ways, that can be a good thing because you can stay up later and study a little bit. You can fight off disease better. When, when do you get sick? After. After, when you go home, right? That's because now your stress response is turned off and your immune system now takes over. Um, yep. So in terms of, uh, sorry, got distracted by the mic. Um, in terms of stress and, and use stress, why is it that if we think about stress as though it's a good thing, as though it's just energizing our body to do something that we can conquer, then the sympathetic response changes to have, you know, instead of having um, vasoconstriction, you have vasodilation, and it's like, it's a healthy stress. Um, how does that work with cortisol? Um, I'm not, so, the stress response is good in the short term, right? like getting away from the line or studying for finals, it's not good in the long term, right? 
I'm, I don't think I'm getting your question. Sorry. Um, no, there's been recent research mm -hmm. that's shown that uh, if you just think about stress differently, it, you don't have the negative consequences of oh, it. Oh, I see. So, right. So what we, we aren't going to get into is that there's, there are multiple levels of the stress response. And one is the release of epinephrine or adrenaline as well, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the initial thing that happens. That's sort of what gives you the rush if you're just about to be hit by a car when you see the lion, right? And so... Those two things, if you can learn to dampen that, then you can regulate your stress response. The problem is, is that if you're stuck in traffic in a car, what happens? Your stress response gets activated. But is it doing any good? No, it's not. That stress response was made so that you could run away from the lion, not so that it doesn't help you in the car at all. It helps you with finals for a little bit up to a point, right? But if you can't, if it keeps adding, if it keeps um, getting larger and larger, then it's not going to be beneficial. So I think that's what you're talking about. You're talking about sort of dampening that stress response in a more productive way. Sorry, it's not exactly dampening. Okay. It's, um, they did this research where it shows, um, so if you know, these certain people have high stress jobs mm -hmm. and they consider stress a bad thing, mm -hmm. then they have all the negative consequences of you know, bad hearts and all of that. Um, but if they have high stress jobs but consider stress a good thing, they, just, mm. they, they oh, say, oh, this saying. is good, oh. then their body actually physiologically changes to mm. address the stress in a positive way where they don't have you know, the constricted arteries and stuff that lead to these negative heart consequences. Yeah. And instead, they, they have the cortis, um, cortisol response, but uh -huh. it doesn't cause the bad things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm not familiar with that research. I mean, my guess would be that if they're thinking about stress in a positive way, then the stress isn't stressing them out, and they aren't prolonging their <laughs> stress response. So I still think at some level they must be having a shorter or dampened stress response. But I don't, th that's my guess. I don't know, though. If I, I have to read that. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, Okay, so I think I've said everything that I want to say about stress. Said it's good in the short term, but not good in the long term. Yeah. You you mentioned that um, exposure to long to stress for a long time increases anxiety and can cause depression. Well, it, it can lead to that. It can lead right. to that, and you also mentioned that anxiety and depression are more common in women. Is there is there a, a relationship between that or a, a different way that women experience stress? De definitely, definitely. So, and there's a whole huge area of research that goes into that. So sex differences in, the, in stress, right? And there are sex differences early on. So if you, we're, we're getting off topic here, I hope that's okay. If you take um, mother rats and you stress them, right? So they have increases in cortisol, that means the fetuses inside, right, um, inside, in, in the pregnant mother are also exposed to that cortisol. Well, they will grow, males and females will grow up to have a different, it, it will have a different effect on them in adulthood, right? So it affects males differently. Actually, males are more prone to the stress response then, just from the fact that their mothers were stressed. And in adulthood, um, and then also the reproductive axis plays into this as well. So the reproductive axis is the hypothalamic pituitary in women, ovarian um, axis, right, ovaries. And that axis interplays with the HPA axis. So basically when your reproduct when a woman's reproductive axis goes um, when women's stress axis goes up, the reproductive axis becomes less active. And so they sort of play off each other. So definitely men and women respond differently to stress. Um, and it's all related to also how receptors are expressed in the brain. So this cortisol is binding to receptors in the brain, and there are different receptor levels. So it's all, yeah, definitely. It's a very, very interesting area of research. Okay, so um, now let's look at stress and financial risk taking. So getting back to our um, uh, financial risk preferences tests. So this one research group found that when... Um, the standard deviation in profits and loss, when they were greater out here, cortisol levels were also higher, right? So this is getting at, I think, a comment before, that when profits and losses were more volatile, bigger extremes, right, their people's cortisol levels, these were men, uh, men's cortisol levels were higher as opposed to when profits and losses were less variable, 
Am I doing that? Were less variable. Um, when profit and loss differences were less variable, there was less cortisol. So increase in volatility of a trader's profits and loss, which actually correlates with the market. So when the market is less stable, then traders' profits and losses are, are more volatile. That correlates with increased cortisol. So then these researchers wanted to ask, well, does this increase in cortisol influence decision making? And so I thought they did this in a, in a very interesting way. So what they did was they set up these choices that people could make. Here's lottery, one lottery choice and another lottery choice. These are in pounds and, you know, like mon uh, English monetary units. So in this situation, you have a person has a small chance of getting 90 pounds, but a much larger chance of getting 60 pounds. But in this situation, they have a smaller chance of, a greater chance of getting 90, a smaller chance of getting 60, but also a chance of getting nothing, right? <coughs> so the idea is that this is safer and this is riskier, right? And then what they did was they increased people's cortisol levels. So they gave them pills that increased their cortisol levels. Increased it either for one day or eight days. So here they exposed them to acute increase in cortisol or a more chronic increase in cortisol. And then obviously they had their control, right? Placebo. And what they found was that those people who were exposed chronically and this is the proportion that they chose this safe one increased, right? So if they had more cortisol, they made the safer bet, right? Increased chronic cortisol, increased risk aversion, or increased these people's um, decision to take the safe bet. So they found this to be the case both in men and women, this particular aspect. Yep. Okay, thank you. I'm curious to know, did the placebo have a significant effect? Like, did people in the control group have increased cortisol or increased stress because they were told they're giving these pills that were going to make them more stressed? Oh. Was that significant at all, or how did they account for that? That's a great question. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think they addressed it in the article. Yeah. Um, I mean, the idea was they went back and confirmed. What they did was they took these people who were exposed to chronic levels were taken up, sorry, to this same level. Um, but I don't know if taking a pill that someone tells you might increase your cortisol levels, if that does or not. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point. Okay, so um, let's talk about what this might mean for the market then. I know you guys, there are probably lots of econ majors here, and you guys already know more about econ than I do. But uh, let's look at what the effects of this might be on the market. So there's a bear market and a bull market. What are the differences? What's a bear market? Okay, thank you. Bear market is when things are really just going down the toilet. Going down. Uh, yeah. And the bull market? Bull market is when things are booming, everyone's doing great, super happy. That's right, everyone's happy. So another aside, anyone know why the, there's a symbol of bear and bull? So what I, what I heard is that a bull strikes upward with its horn, so that it's an upward motion, and a bear swipes down when it attacks. I don't know, but it sounded good to me. It sounded good to me. Um, all right, so if you have someone in a bear market, right? Well, let's take the bull market. Someone in a bull market, they're winning, they're doing well, they're making lots of money, right? Then that could lead to what's called irrational exuberance, right? Or what Alan Greenspan called irrational exuberance back in the 90s during the dot-com bubble. And I think he would probably apply it to the housing bubble as well. So the idea is that people may make riskier choices, right? Or may be more aggressive about what they're doing. Conversely, in a bear market, when there's more volatility, or at least when things are going down, I guess, and there might be more cortisol around, right? People might... Um, 
uh, <coughs> people are driven, when people are faced in a stressful situation, one thing we do know about people under stress is they seek out what's familiar, right? And you think about it, it makes sense. So you, f you seek out what's familiar and what's safe. And what they found is people in, in these bear markets seek out the safe bets, the government bonds, and things like that. Right? And that makes sense if you think about when you're stressed, you know, you sort of go with what's familiar, right? Um, you know, you want to go with the food that's comforting, the food that you know, you don't want to go out and try something new and crazy. So that leads me to, if you're ever registering for classes, you shouldn't do it when you're stressed, right? Because when you're stressed, you're just going to go with those classes that you know are safe. But if you're not stressed, then you'll go with those classes that are going to expand you into that philosophy class, that intro neuroscience <coughs> class, whatever. So one possibility is that testosterone in a bull market might lead to more irrational exuberance on the, on the trading floor. And maybe higher levels of cortisol lead to irrational pessimism. And I don't know if this is a term. I just put that in there. Um, and this is just something that, that um, I'm <coughs> suggesting might, might happen. Um, but what it could do is it could lead to higher fluctuations in the market, right? When you're in a bull market, people do riskier and riskier things. And when you're in a bear market, when you actually need people to do risky things and buy up risky assets and take a chance, they're not willing to do it, right? So hormones may actually play a role in market fluctuations. It's possible. Okay, so now let's talk about another hormone. Um, that's not a gonadal hormone, it's not an androgen or an uh, uh, estrogen, um, and it's not a uh, stress hormone, but oxytocin. So it's sort of thought of as the wonder hormone, it's also called the love hormone. It does lots of different things. So physiologically it's involved in uterine contractions during birth. It's also involved in milk ejection during lactation. So when a mother when a baby suckles, that sends a nerve signal to the brain and signals the brain to tell the pituitary, again, that gland at the bottom of the brain, tells the pituitary to release oxytocin, and then when oxytocin circulates to the breast, it causes milk ejection. So this is why, if you've ever heard women who can actually hear a baby cry, some women that will actually cause milk letdown, right? It's through this process, this same process. Okay, so oxytocin does that. In animal models, it's also involved in lots of behavioral effects. So it's involved in maternal behavior, in pair bonding in adults, and in social recognition. So the ability of one animal to recognize another animal that's already seen or in a certain social context. In humans, we know that in both sexes it increases after orgasm, and it's thought that it might also be involved in bonding between humans. And in human uh, pathogenesis, it's been implicated in disorders like autism, social phobia, and schizophrenia. So actually, there's some people who are using, who are trying to see if oxytocin treatment can help with severely autistic children, and this idea that it might be involved in bonding. Researchers wanted to see if oxytocin had an effect on trust in this um, financial risk preference setting. So this is a really interesting little game they devised. So what they did was they had an investor, and this investor was given 12 monetary units that would later be transferred into real money. So they're given 12 monetary units, each of, uh, out of four, four different times. And each time they could give a trustee either all of these monetary units or zero. So they give them zero, four, eight, or 12. So let's take this situation where they give a trustee 12. When they give the trustee 12, <coughs> what's done is that monetary unit is tripled to 36 and then they add the initial 12 to get 48. So now that trustee has 48. And that trustee can now give back any amount he or she wants. Anywhere from 0 to 48, back to the investor. Right? So the idea, is he, the idea here is that you're testing the trust of the investor. How much are they going to trust this person to give them back money. The more they give them, then potentially the more they'll get back, right? And then what they did was they gave this investor oxytocin. So they had two groups, investors that were given oxytocin and investors that weren't. And now they wanted to see how it would affect their trust. Are there any questions about it? 
So what they found is that oxytocin over placebo really dramatically increased the amount of monetary units that this investor was willing to give the trustee. So are there other ways to interpret these data? It could be reverse causality. The people that trusted others more had more oxytocin to begin with? Or were they given oxytocin? They were given oxytocin, okay. yeah. You actually can do it with a nasal spray. That's awful. It's like an allergy medicine. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it possible that it's less about the trust you have in that country, more about if you have less trust in yourself? Hmm. I guess I hadn't thought about it that way. So you're saying that oxytocin would decrease the trust in yourself? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Be a yeah. To avoid yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, is oxytocin, does it make you feel like euphoric or is this sort of like they could just be high? Right. No. <laughs> no, that's a great point. That's a great point. So if you guys know any women who have breastfed and you talk to them, they will talk about how much they love it, right? And one of the reasons why is not just they're there with their baby, which is wonderful, but they're getting this rush of oxytocin. So exactly, it does make one feel good. So it may just be that they feel good and they give away more money, right? Right? So the, the, the researchers thought of that and they did something. What they did was they then replaced, I'll go back, they replaced this trustee. These are people in this situation, but now they replaced them with a computer, right? So now it's just uh, a computerized random effect where the computer is going to play back what these trustees have done in the past in the same pattern, in the same amounts, but it's going to be randomized, right? So now the effect is gone. So now the effect is gone where those people given placebo aren't giving more. And I'd point out, you really don't want to hang out with these people, <laughs> right? The investors who aren't giving anything away. Um, so really, what, they, what the author suggests is that oxytocin increases trust in the investor when social interaction is involved, right? When they know that there's a social interaction. So that's why they're suggesting that this is an issue of trust. Yeah. Um, so I noticed that when actual people involved, nobody gives zero. Um, so yeah. is that, is there sort of a almost cultural shame level, like nobody wants to be the jerk that doesn't give anything? Is that there, I don't know that there's a way to control for that, but is that yeah. also potentially affected? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. They didn't, I don't think they, I don't remember them talking about that. I also don't know how significant this was, right? It's, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, you, you could definitely design an experiment to test that, right? It's interesting. Okay, so um, just sort of in closing here, we have uh, lots of decisions in our life that we need to make, right? Different paths that we want to go down, different roads to choose. And I think that understanding sort of the brain mechanisms that are involved in decision making is important. And I think the better we understand this, the better we can understand um, what goes into this decision making process. Now I realize that what I've talked about today are these sort of fun little games, right, that people play to get at these questions. And it might not be directly relevant to what you guys want to do. What you guys want to do is go out and solve big, important global problems. And I think that's what's wonderful about the Albright Institute. But what I hope you guys can do is when you're out there dealing with these situations, understand that the people you're dealing with have to make decisions and put those decisions in context when you're dealing with them, right? So one thing we learned is that winners and losers can, or winning and losing can affect one's behavior and how they make decisions. Also, stress can affect decisions, right? And so I realize that you're not dealing with 
the stress of 12 monetary units and what do I do with 12 monetary units, you're dealing with much bigger issues. But many of you, I think, are going to go into very depressed areas that might be, um, you know, have been ravaged by war before or poverty and really big stressors. And these kinds of things are going to have effects on the way people make their decisions. And I think it's important to have that in context when you're dealing with these people. And I think when you're trying to maybe get getting them to see a different side of the, you know, the different repercussions of the decisions they can make, right? It's, I think, helpful to see where they're coming from and what factors might be influencing that when they're making these decisions. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So there's research that shows that when you uh, stand with like your arms splayed out and your feet wide apart that your testosterone levels actually increase. Um, do you have any explanation for why this might have occurred? So that's the, the power pose. Yes. Yeah. I forgot her name now. Um, oh, okay. Oh, did you guys talk about this? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Um, well, I think it's this idea that so. Often we talk about how hormones influence behavior, right? But behavior can influence hormones. And so we actually, that that's, uh, comes across in taking two chess players, right? And you have the winner having higher testosterone levels than the loser. That's an example of behavior affecting hormones. And I think this is just another example. I, th I don't know what the mechanism for that is. I think it's a fascinating question. Um, I, I, I've heard this, uh, what, what, what's her name? And that's right, and I've seen her, her TED talk, I was really impressed by it, I actually showed it to my capstone some neuroscience seminar class and we talked about it for a while. I don't know what that mechanism is and I think it would be interesting to do those studies, right, to, to, to see that. I mean, I think, I think in some ways it, <laughs> it might tie in a little bit with, with yoga, right, for any of you who do yoga or have studied it, that, you know, how one holds their body, how you open up, open up your chest can affect how you feel, it also probably affects your endocrine system, right? But yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I think it would be interesting for someone to, to test that. Yeah. Um, you're mentioning at one point how uh, the hormones that you have at birth uh, dictate your brain and its structure mm -hmm. and that that never changes. Um, and I was, I'm, I'm wondering because uh, Helen Fisher, um, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, uh, but she did all of the like chemistry.com uh, studies oh. for uh, behavior, and she links it to testosterone, estrogen, uh, dopamine, and serotonin. Uh -huh. And she was mentioning how a traumatic event can drastically shift the proportions of those in your brain, uh, which in so doing can change your personality. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, so, so, what, I, so what I was saying before is that, um, and I maybe misspoke, I was suggesting uh, or telling you that studies done on rats indicate that exposure to testosterone uh, in the uterus and just after birth will cause the brain to become more male-like, and that doesn't change. But in no, I, I didn't mean to say that hormone levels later won't change. But once, once a brain has differentiated, at least with regard to a rat brain, once it's differentiated into a more male-like brain or female-like brain, that doesn't really change over the course of life. But yes, definitely traumatic events um, can have profound effects on people's hormone systems and their brains. I mean, I think PTSD is probably the best example, right, where a traumatic event can lead to um, really uh, sort of misaligning that HPA axis, that stress axis, where it no longer can provide the appropriate negative feedback that it needs to. And these people can be exposed to chronic levels of cortisol, and over time that can do damage. So it actually, they've shown that um, people with PTSD have decreases in the amount of brain cells they have in specific areas that are involved in learning and memory, and that's all due to these high levels of cortisol. So yeah, that's, that's a, definitely a, something that can happen, and does happen, yeah. A quick follow-up. Sure. Um, so the actual structure of the brain, does that dictate decision-making? So when we think of transgendered people, yeah. is their brain always going to be as it was born? Yeah, that's a great question too. So. You know, I think that's a, it's probably dangerous to put too much emphasis on brain structure, and I think it's probably better to 
um, put an emphasis on brain activity and brain function. So I was sort of alluding to this. I mean, just because a brain region's bigger doesn't mean that it's doing something better. Um, it's really a matter of the cells in that brain region and how those brain cells are functioning. So I think that, um, I, I didn't get to it, but there are brain structure differences in homosexuals versus heterosexuals. And there have been some studies, but we don't know how to interpret that, right? So I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about this. If, if you have a homosexual man that has a different brain structure than a heterosexual man, you know, a brain region that's a little bit bigger, what are ways to interpret that? like um, depending on when they're tested in life like just there's so many societal differences in how a homosexual man grows up and how a heterosexual man grows up so their brain could have developed differently like it like that's nature a, versus nurture thing yeah exactly that's a great point so if you're if you're at a cocktail party and you tell people well this brain region is bigger in homosexual men than it is in heterosexual men most people will jump to the conclusion oh that's maybe what caused them to be homosexual but I think your interpretation is just as likely and maybe more likely that it may be that experiences that they had during their life changed their brain structure. We know that that happens during, during one's life, that brain structures can change. So there are different ways to interpret that. Getting at the answer to that question is very difficult, right? Um, with the techniques that we have today, you can't really do, you can't do invasive techniques. So you, you would have to do, um, you, it'd be very difficult to test people at all points in their life. So there are different ways to, to interpret that. Differences in, in brain structures. Um, and also, actually, one study has come out with transgender showing differences in brain structures, but those um, transgender people have gone through hormone, uh, some have gone through hormone therapy, so that changes the brain. So um, it's not enough to look just at brain structure. I think one needs to look at how the cells are operating, what's in those cells. You alluded to some chemicals, neurotransmitters and different levels of those neurotransmitters are going to act on those brain cells and dictate how those brain cells function. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the difficulties of um, looking at these tests in humans, because mm -hmm. um, obviously when you look at the rats, I assume that you dissect their That's brains, right. that, and you obviously can't do that with humans. Right. And so what are the means we have available now to look at um, patterns in human brains? Can you take like giant pictures? I know that. Yeah, so, so I showed <laughs> one. So this is called an, an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. So this is like a snapshot of the brain. It's sort of like a, you can look at it as an x-ray of the brain, right? Um, and so this technique was developed in the late 80s and came into play really big in the early 90s. And then Right after this, a uh, technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is those images with all the different colors that you see all the time. And those are showing you brain activity. So those are showing you what brain regions are becoming more or less active um, in response to a certain stimuli. But there's some problems with the way those are done um, and the limitations of those techniques. But those are sort of, I guess, fMRI is probably the most commonly used technique to look at um, human brains and how they function. But I think, you know, as time goes on, we'll get better and better techniques and we'll be able to address questions. You know, I think these kinds of techniques, MRIs, will, be, will have higher and higher resolution. So we can, look at smaller brain ref, diff, we can look at smaller brain regions and see differences that we can't see now. And fMRI and other techniques will become even better. Yeah. And then there are ways to test the brain. You can, um, you can uh, look at electrical activity of the brain as well. So you've seen people with all those things on their head, right? So that's reading electrical activity, but the limit there is that you're only seeing that electrical activity on the outside of the brain, not what's going on inside the brain. But I think all these kinds of things will change probably in your lifetime. Um, are there broader questions in neuroscience or in the science of hormones um, that you think are important and are close to being answered or need more work? Sure, yeah, there, there are lots of questions. I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, there are lots of questions directly related to disease, right? Diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and depression. What's, what's going on in the brain? 
how are these, you know, in all those diseases, there are brain regions, cells in certain brain regions that are dying, and why are those brain cells dying? Using Parkinson's as an example, um, why, you know, we know where the brain cells are dying, we know exactly where they are in the brain, um, and what kind of neurons are dying, but we don't know why they're dying. So I think those kinds of questions are actually burning questions from a clinical standpoint. But I think on a, on a larger area, I, I think this idea of sexual differentiation of the brain and the role that hormones are playing in, in um, you know, pushing the brain to be more female-like or more male-like, I think are really fascinating and interesting and very complicated. And, you know, when these events are happening and how they're happening and when they stop happening, right? And we, we don't know any of these answers. And I think, for me, that's a, a really interesting question, for sure. Yeah. So we're going to have to stop there. I want to okay. first of all, thank Mark very much for coming over this afternoon. Sure. Thank you.